We're going to get started by just briefly introducing our work and then we'll dive into the nitty gritty. So, Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeanette. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all and to share space today with everyone. I'm excited uh, to hear everyone's thoughts, to learn a little bit about you, uh, and to honestly just think about visual storytelling and through the lens of our own work and also um, collective identity. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of start us off a little bit. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And so I am a also a visual storyteller. I am a light worker in all the ways that uh, that word encompasses the way that we exist in light and that we come from light. I'm, I'm also an education designer. I work with a number of cultural institutions across New York City um, and actually nationally. And I work with a lot of court involved individuals to be thinking about our own narratives um, and how do we counter those narratives and what are uh, exactly the gaps in those narratives um, in the way that we begin to understand ourselves uh, as humans on this planet. Um, I am also an archivist, specifically working with the archives of my family. Um, it's central to my practice uh, in thinking about the ways that my family has immigrated from the Caribbean and what is it to exist in two soils um, and essentially uh, having multiple homes and not really ever feeling like home in either one. Uh, and so it brings me to sort of the first question that I think about in my own practice and one that I want us to think about collectively, which is what do our archives say about our existence? And the word archive is quite a loaded one and one that we hope to unpack together uh, throughout our session and thinking about an archive as a collection, a repository for our stories. And essentially what happens when you don't have access to those um, or there's been a rapture. And for myself and my own family, I work a lot with images and documentation uh, between family members intergenerationally uh, and how some of those archives have actually been lost or that there is a gap. And so therefore there's a gap in my own history. These are my parents um, and my father was a photographer and without ever really claiming that term, but he's the human that gave me my first camera, my first light working tool. Um, and I became absolutely obsessed with organizing his photographs chronologically or what I thought was chronologically. I didn't exist during those moments, uh, but I was sort of trying to figure out what was the timeline and, um, and without knowing also working simultaneously through the timeline of the history of photography and printmaking and um, for example, uh, Kodak and Agfa paper and the way that colors have shifted throughout time to actually think about uh, black and brown representation with film. And so I, through mining these archives and working with my father's photographs, I think a lot about what is home, what is place, uh, and specifically, what does that mean for me as a first gen? Uh, so I work with multimedia installations where I'm incorporating my father's images alongside of my own images. I've been blessed with the opportunity of actually living in both spaces, both in New York City and also in Santo Domingo, and being able to go back and think Think about what is it to be an American queer femme uh, also existing in this space where there were so many limitations upon my own family members. And so I like to I like for us all to think um, about how we can begin to acknowledge the fractures present and move towards closure. Uh, and so thinking about moments in our own lives where maybe we have lost something, and this could be in ways of thinking around memory, uh, in thinking about moving from physically from one place to another and maybe losing a, a piece of, of an image or a document or a diary or writing um, that spoke to that specific time frame, um, and what happens when you no longer have it tangibly. Uh, and so through the work that we're going to be creating together, thinking in terms of that idea of closure, what does it mean to receive closure, get closure? What does that process actually look like? 
And for me, it began with really losing my mother. Uh, when she passed away, all of our belongings from, from when I was a child were lost with the exception of three boxes of photographs and a few of her diaries. And I never got to really know my mother as an adult. And so I relied heavily on her diaries to really understand who my mother was um, outside of just this human who cared for me, but also who was this human who was a wife, a friend, a sister. And I grew up primarily with my aunts. So I have many different moms um, and you know, the good and the bad of that, of having many cooks in the kitchen or having many voices kind of telling you what to do, but also very grateful to actually have these beautiful beings in my life um, who at various points, maybe we didn't really 100% understand each other. But I think that through my work, I do try to understand how uh, time and place has impacted us. So I want us to also think about uh, in what ways can our work create visibility? Whether that's create visibility through healing, create visibility through closure, create visibility of individuals that maybe we have no, we no longer have access to or memories that we no longer have access to. Uh, and so I'm gonna also now pass it over to the wonderful Jasmine who will intro themselves. I'm Jasmine Jones. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. This is a still of my website. It's unfortunate because my website is, has a lot of multimedia, so you should go check it out. Um, but yeah, I too identify as a visual storyteller. And for me, what that means is I'm someone who works across many different mediums, uh, and I'm often trying to do what's right for the work. So if I like it's oftentimes I'll have like an intention or a story that really moves me and then I'm figuring out what is the right medium for that story. So that might be a series of images that might be a, a short film or video art. It could be an installation piece. I could curate a show with other existing things that are out there. Um, and for me, oftentimes that is really based in the screen. Um, and in my work too, I would be remiss not to acknowledge my collective uh, or the collective I'm a part of, Bufu Bias For Us, uh, which started out as a documentary collective looking at Black and Asian cultural and political relationships. Um, and through that work, I've really, I think, begun to think of documentary as a tool. Um, and, you know, these films can be uh, guided and facilitated conversations or meditations. Um, so, yeah, and we're gonna talk about the relationship to the archive. It's fraught, you know, um, my personal relationship, but I'm also often like pulling from it or trying to create films out of images that don't exist. So I'm gonna switch it up a little bit from the last workshop and I'm just gonna go through chronologically some stills and gifts of videos that I've made in the past. Um, and we can kind of see the growth, um, but I'm also just gonna dissect how they were made because when I'm making these screen films, um, these are really things that you can do in a pandemic. And I wanted to like share tools that are actually accessible in these times. And like, you know, I realized that a lot of my films could have been made in the context of like a stay at home order. Um, and this is not all of the work. I've, I've taken some things out of here, but oh, we're missing one video. So this is a still, okay. So these are early Jasmine Jones video art pieces, very undergraduate feminist art going on here. So right here we have a film called Why You Broke Up, um, which takes place all in a screen. Um, and I'm using the interface of Storybook Weaver as like a 90s millennial baby where you could like, you were encouraged to create your own story. So I'm like telling the story of all of these different people I broke up with. Um, it's very navel gazy. Um, and then on the right, we have another film that is a screen film and it's called Like Mike. And it's based in an anecdote where my first kiss, I was like intimidated at a school dance to like kiss this boy. And I was so nervous. I kissed his like, I went for his cheek, but I kissed his ear. And so everyone called me Mike Tyson. Um, and so I'm like, as I'm unpacking that, I also found all these deeply disturbing videos on YouTube of young girls being intimidated into their first kiss. And so like, I'm trying to like work through this early trauma. Um, so moving on, we're not actually gonna get into my breakup stories. Oh, you get a little story book weaver there. Um, so 
This is another early film. Um, it's called Period Piece. You could check it out. And it's me working through my relationship to men and menstruation. And all of the visuals are pretty much filmed in my apartment by my partner. And then I'm also pulling these like archives of like flowers and water droplets uh, to symbolize the process of menstruating. There's like, there, it has a real twist at the end. Um, and basically I'll spoil my own film. My partner was also an undergraduate artist and was into collecting my blood for some like future project. And I began to be really weary of that. And so, there's a challenge of uh, basically of like, what do they do with that blood? And you should watch the film, it's on Vimeo. Um, I wouldn't make that film now, but it is. A lot of people remember that scene. Um, this is another film I'm gonna dissect, um, dedicated to my mentor. And it's all about me being a flake. And you know, as you can see here, I'm searching for a visual metaphor to apologize to my mentor. And so just to break it down and show you how the sausage is made, I have this nice like cloud backdrop that I pulled from the internet. Um, and then I've isolated these texts from my mentor that are really sweet, where they just keep checking in on me. Um, and then I've taken this scene from one of their films. And I'm talking about how like, I've learned so much from them. And um, yeah, how it's moved me. And then I have like some of their voice recordings. So again, this is a film, a screen film could be made at home. Um, this is a more recent film. It's called Unlocked. You should also check it out. And it's all, it's basically a film um, that was made within the context of the pandemic where the internet was really intense and depressing. And so basically I made this montage of black femmes cutting the locks off of white people. Um, and that's set to some affirmations from the hood hippie, which I also found on YouTube and got consent from her. And together we create this like nice, meditative video art uh, for for the folks out there. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge this project, All Black ASMR, which is a little, and I think this is coming back to like, do what's right for the work. So this is more of a curatorial hobby of mine that I would like to return to um, and may return to if the internet gets extremely dark. But basically I was seeing there were these trends of ASMR videos and they were often very like white or um, Asian. And I was like, yo, I am curious if this would resonate with me and other people if it was focused on black folks, because um, black folks know how to make all sorts of beautiful imagery. And so sometimes I'm also just trolling the idea of ASMR and it's like memes and like viral videos and like anything that evokes laughter because at the end of the day, um, ASMR is just videos that evoke a feeling of goodness. Um, yeah, and so just want to leave us with these quotes and really kind of talking about, you can see where I was at with my early work where it's like, we're dealing with these kind of like intense images from YouTube of young girls and like moving forward, it's like we're dealing with images from YouTube, but it's like, there's um, a slightly more empowered gaze. And for me, I'm trying like through learning about, you know, making documentary as a tool with Bufu and sometimes sacrificing entertainment value for things that are just like more meditative or encourage more reflecting reflection within an audience. Um, yeah, I want to make work that feels good on a soul level. So these are some quotes I think about, and we're going to keep talking about healing throughout this workshop, but the, I just love this devotional cinema. Um, there's a PDF of this online, but yeah. I, this resonates with me. So there is something in the actual nature of the cinema, its view that could produce health or illness in an audience. There might be a film that had a very meaningful subject, but was so inelegantly handled that it actually left one feeling unhealthy or alienated. So I feel like my like Mike film, you know, the Mike Tyson, it was a cool idea, but it's also like, oh, watching those videos as a girl, that didn't feel that good. So like now I'm like, okay, how can I make something that feels better? Um, and then how does the filmmaker sculpt light in harmony with its subject matter? How can light be deeply in union with evocation? And so I really like just basically setting up this like idea of film. It is this, this uh, gesture, it, it can create transcendence within an audience. And so it really is a devotional act both for the audience and for the creator and for the subject matter. And I think Jeanette will um, touch on some of that in an exercise later too. Um, so yeah. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. So this is a good moment, I guess, like take a stretch, but also if you got pen and paper, um, if you're an analog person like me, you know, you might want to take some notes. We're beginning, we're going to begin to prep you to do some exercises. Um, so I'm going to move forward in my presentation. All right. 
She's loading. All right, so this is my this is my workflow. No matter what I'm doing, I'm making a video for a client. I'm making a video for myself. Video art, short film, whatever. This is pretty much how I'm thinking about it. So first, I need to gather those assets. Um, that we're going to talk more about, like how I'm actually pulling from these spaces, like YouTube and this like old archival footage. But sometimes I'm recording it from my phone ingestion. So you gather those assets, then you want to review your footage. Um, and today we'll be focusing a little more on iMovie just because we figured that's the most accessible and Jeanette will cue us into that. Um, but whatever you're using, whatever interface, even if it's just in your phone, you want to isolate the best parts and figure out what you're, what you're working with within those assets. Um, it's always nice. I like to take, like I said, analog notes with time codes. So if I'm seeing something cute, and then I also like to start to trim down my clips. So that'll save me time later when I want to actually start to move things out. Then I like to map things out with a story arc and a paper edit, which I will show you guys some, some story arcs that you can use. Um, and you, like I said, I'm an analog girl, but the cool thing we're doing here is we're also demystifying um, linear editing. So, you know, like it, it, we're making things on, on computers, you can move things around. So that's where you get into assembling your cut. And I like to, you know, I'll make something, maybe I like it, maybe I copy and paste it, you know, like I have fun, sometimes I walk away, sometimes I come back. Um, it's when I was working on these personal documentaries, I was in a class where basically you had to make a film a week and you were graded, like the more vulnerable it was, the better your grade was, which was quite, like it really challenged me. And that's where I started making a lot of these screen films. Um, but I realized with that process, especially when making personal documentaries, the first cut, it, it ain't it. I always had to make one cut and I'm like, this ain't it. And then the second cut, I'd be like, we're, we're getting somewhere. So I feel like for me, the more personal film is usually there's like, you have to hit that crisis point. And that's when you're like really starting to like get to the meat of it. Maybe that's not the most sustainable practice, but that's my practice. Um, so then after I've gone through the crisis point, I start to review, I fine tune. That's when you want to go in you want to do your audio mixing make sure the levels aren't crazy all of oh, excuse me for the ableism you want to make sure the audio levels aren't just all over the place um you want to color correct and make sure that the colors look good you can get into the weeds if you start your edit with color correction or audio mixing um and you might be color correcting clips that don't make it into the final cut so you know save that for last and then you export it then you upload it and you share it over here you see the little image there is like, this is my bread and butter. I literally, you can do it. I could share it with you in this one screenshot, but in QuickTime Player, there is this function screen recording um, and you can choose to record the audio within your computer. You can choose to record um, the audio on the mic of your computer. That is amazing. And so a lot of the times when you're seeing like, videos of me in a chat room or things that are playing out in real time, uh, I'm, I'm using that. Uh, the, the files can be pretty heavy, but we'll talk more about that. There's um, also on your iPhone, you can do screen recordings on your iPhone. I do a lot of airdropping from my phone to my computer. Okay, so this is the, this is also the bread and butter. And I have to shout out my mentor from that film, Hey Kirthi, the mentor I was ducking because she shared these with me. And you can see, like, I've learned so much. So Kirthi Nath, wonderful filmmaker, check her out. Um, but... I'm gonna first start by the schema. And so this applies to documentary, narrative, what have you, but this is just like a way of like, when I'm sitting down, I'm really intention driven. I wanna make sure that I know like what I'm saying. It's usually not extremely experimental. I enter and edit with a point. Um, so I enter and I'm like, what is my story? What am I making a film about? Um, what's the conflict? Uh, or if there's no conflict um, and it's more documentary based then what's the driving force? What are we searching for here? Then I'm trying to figure out what do I want people to take away? What's the message of this film? Or what are the themes that are coming out throughout the film? Um, what do I want people to be considering? Then the aesthetics. I love aesthetics. Um, and that, that word has been bastardized uh, since this model was shared with me. Um, and now it's just, yeah, it's a hashtag. But what are these? So visually, what are we seeing? What are the colors of the film? Um, what are the framing devices, composition, audio? What are we hearing? Um, what's the scoring? Are we hearing voice memos? I use a lot of voice memos and rough rough recordings from my iPhone. The iPhone or your phones have great microphones in them. I, even if I'm recording 
a feature film, I'll have the iPhone running backup because sometimes that might save you. So that's a tool that you can do at home. Um, and then text. Text can be super powerful. Not all of us like using our voices. Um, sometimes the like automated robot voice doesn't do the trick. Text can be a great uh, way to tell a story uh, and do a lot of things and also make your film accessible in different ways too. Um, so I encourage you all to think about captioning in 2021. And then audience, where will this film live? Who do you want to see it? Um, and I encourage you also to really hone in on that and not just be like everybody, but like think a little more specifically. Um, and when I say, where will this live? It's not just like, you know, where will you upload it? But also, are you going to be submitting it to festivals? Um, are you going to be doing those sort of things? Because if so, you might want to make sure that you export multiple files. So that is the schema. It can apply to literally any project you're doing, visual storytelling project. And then over here, you just have your story arc. And so when I say I do a paper edit, um, I am just drawing a shape that looks sort of like this. And then I might use the top of that line to be like, here is my visuals. And the bottom of the line is like, here's what we're hearing. And I'll kind of just map out like intro. Oh, I loved that shot at the beach. Boom. Then I want to go to a close up of the water. And when I'm at the close up of the water here, I'm gonna put some audio of waves and then I'm gonna fade the waves out. And so I'm beginning to see where my edit will go. Um, these just again, demystifying editing, we're gonna get into iMovie. Just wanted to show you like, I'm an Adobe Premiere girl myself. Um, I've used Final Cut Pro in the past. iMovie works too. They're all the same thing with different design. Um, so today, like I just say, get your feet wet. Whatever you have is the best one. Um, whatever you can get for free is the best one. I might know some people if you need help access accessing maybe the Creative Cloud, maybe. I'm not sure if that still works, but hit me up. Um, and then, okay, so we're about to get into our exercise, people. I'm going to give you, we'll check in at about five maybe 10. Um, the goal here is I'm going to have you pull three clips from three different archives. You interpret archive to mean whatever you want it to mean. The parameter that I would suggest would be, what do you find to be like healing? Three clips that are healing. They can be still, still images, but I, again, we're working on visual storytelling. There's a film submission component that could come in at the back end. So I would encourage you to find some clips. Um, and we're just gonna gather. We're not gonna assemble, it's just the gathering process. Um, and then in the next exercise, we'll begin to actually assemble those clips together, but three clips from three different archives. The archives that I would encourage you to consider, what's in your phone, airdrop that down. You know, like, what do you got favorited? Um, what's, on your what's on your computer? Posts on social media. So not only like what you've posted, what are you tagged in? That's content of you. You know, sometimes other people got the best stuff of you. Um, and there's like weird, weird stuff. You go far back enough in Facebook, not all of us have like scrubbed our Facebook. So you might find some interesting content there. Um, YouTube also, there's a whole thing called the fair use law that I really encourage y'all to deeply research as you begin to like, if you're making art and especially if you're appropriating other people's stuff in your art, um, there are certain laws. Generally, if you're like chopping and screwing it and making it your own and it's, there's rules. I'm pretty loosey goosey with it. I'm pretty punk about it, but also sometimes you might hit limitations around where that work can live. Um, so that's part of where you want to think about who is the audience for this? Where do you want it to live? How do you want it to be archived in your own personal archive and in institutional archives? Because sometimes those punk decisions around wanting your own, like this song or this clip might actually have limitations. Um, and then home videos, Jeanette, a, a master of the home video, chopping and screwing, and then physical archives. We can't really do that right now, but there are physical archives. You can make appointments to go like check out, put on the white gloves, see what that's like in person. Um, and then the OG, OG, archive.org. Archive.org is amazing. And you, if you also are like, I don't want to get into the headache about, you know, pulling from YouTube and not knowing if I'm like violating someone's use, archive.org, you can check a box that allows you to make sure that it is free for public domain. Um, and there's some great stuff on there. If I'm not mistaken, I think like Agnes Varda's footage of the Black Panthers is all like public domain. And that's like a real gift in my in my eyes. It was a little weird she was filming about, so I'm really grateful she filmed it and she's sharing it with the people. So it's really lovely. Um, all right, so I'm gonna set a timer and come out of screen sharing. 
So I would say you can just look for three clips and begin to think about like curatorial, what conversation are you making? But I also think these should be clips that you're excited to work with. So whether or not the audio and video is like exciting to you, like I think you should just find three clips that you're excited to edit. I'm gonna pass things over to Jeanette now that you got your, your healing imagery gathered. It, so I'm going to share my screen a little bit and kind of walk us through a little bit of our thought process in terms of like this concept around healing, why we're focusing on healing images, um, and maybe some questions to help guide you for, for those of us that actually want to continue to get lost or want to revisit um, or want a little bit more time because we will be coming up on a break. And so please utilize that time to actually like go back, stay, stay stuck in that research for a little. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and kind of walk us through some some questions that I have for us. I just want to take a moment and kind of define what this word is. Uh, so how do we define that word? How do we define the word healing? Uh, and this is going to be incredibly personal. Um, so however you think about this word, and I'm just wondering how humans might actually approach defining it. So Jasmine says soothing. Yeah. Definitely. I would add on to that and also say um, process. Like for me to define this word is to think about the process. Um, hi, thank you all for holding space. This is actually really incredible and definitely beyond, I think, what I even anticipated. Um, you know, I think to talk about healing, I don't want to steal the floor, but like it's just amazing because. I think it's interrogating a lot of things that I don't often give myself space to think about. So I just want to say thank you all um, for that. Um, and to also not take up space so other folks can share their, their things of healing, I'll go ahead and uh, share mine. Um, can I share? I'll just start it from here. Um, but yeah, for me, this, I don't know. I suppose I, I think about, um, Black death often because I think, you know, where personally I'm surrounded by it. And I don't say that negatively. I think it's a natural part of our living and our being. And, um, you know, a few years ago, we had a string of friends pass away pretty unexpectedly on a very regular basis. Um, and I just remember just having my camera handy and, and just being, you know, just documenting those times, but I, I always come back to this image because this was one of our close friends, Johnny, um, his funeral. And it's, I don't know, it just doesn't look like a funeral photo to me. Anytime I look at it, it just always reminds me of what we're here to do is to carry on. And this is like very Johnny energy. This is all him. Mm -hmm. And I suppose when I think about healing, this reminds me that all of us in this image and people beyond this carry that. Um, and like, we are the light we always are a light and nobody ever dies. Like they just get passed on through the rest of us. Mm -hmm. um, so in a lot of ways, that's, you know, that's my, that's a healing moment for me um, and one that I carry. Thank you for sharing a bit about yourself and of your, your family, cause that's fam. Yeah. Um, and the way that, you know, I love the way that you're talking about our space and our existence as being energy um, and how we're all carrying that piece, right? And we're all made up of the same matter on this planet and that it, it's like this really beautiful symbiotic relationship. Thank, thank you. That was so jo joyful. <laughs> thank you for that. No, thank you for that. Um, and a beautiful way to describe um, passing, which is just um, another process of the journey. Healing, yeah, is it's not a black and white thing necessarily. Like I kind of saw some pictures of, um, you know, my, my beautiful cat that's passed away who I haven't really memorialised. And um, so, yeah, in a sense, I think it was, it's a process of maybe it can be painful because the first step is just facing whatever was hurtful or whatever, you know, whatever loss you kind of got to heal, heal with or whatever grief you need to go through. So yeah, that's, that's 
yeah, for me, healing is like the first step in a process and it can be painful. It doesn't have to, it can't always be immediately kind of cheerful because there are lots of, yeah, feelings to resolve. So it's a process of resolving feelings, I think. Thank you so much for sharing, um, especially very personal um, uh, background about yourself. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I agree. There's so there's pain that comes with this word, uh, and to think around the acceptance of that and how do we sit with it. There's this practice of restoration, um, of self restoration through any means possible. A practice of resistance and undoing. So even an undoing of something. Um, these are all really beautiful ways of thinking about this word. And if Obviously, we're all approaching it from many different angles, and it's incredibly personal, but it's wonderful to hear the ways in which we are thinking about it, because both of what Jasmine and I think about a lot through our own practice and through our own work is how are we healing parts of ourselves? Um, and through that healing of the self, how does it then impact and um, others and the external um, dimensions? These are all really beautiful ways of thinking about this word. And as we can see, we all have very different entry points to what this can be. For some of us, it is a looking back. For some of us, it is a, a release of something. Um, for some of us, it is this focusing, oh, I love that focusing attention. I, there's this quote that um, attention is a form of prayer. And I strongly believe that the, when, we, when we're present with ourselves or when we're present with another um, in the truest sense of the word that we are in prayer together, a new way to move forward, understanding the complexity of your emotions, oh, understanding the self and awareness of the self, and then a making space. So then like an expansion so that it's no longer about us or about ourselves. It becomes about the we. These are all so beautiful. And so I think that leads us into our next question, which is how do we practice that? What is the practice of the understanding of our complexity and our emotions? And are they one in the same? Because I love the way that we're, we're having this kind of conversation, harm reduction, a source finding. Yeah, source finding or even like speaking to source. Sitting, sitting with something long enough to find what can be repaired and what is irreparable. Meditative walks, meditation, breathing, loving, grounding exercises, vulnerability, the ability to be open, going inward, an overview of music, dancing, movement, right? Shifting energy. And even the stillness mindful exploration. These are all incredibly beautiful. And I'm also, I would love to see this really beautiful scroll of this chat box in a film. Just throwing that out there, Jasmine. Um, and, and so uh, this leads us into our next question, which is what visuals do you find to be healing? And I think it was gorgeous the way that Jasmine uh, shared with us a way that they were caring and loving and healing themselves through visuals um, and through making. And so I'm, I'm wondering for, for humans in this space, like what visuals do you find to be healing? Representation of differently abled people, black queer love, trees, nature, intimacy, videos of Ethiopia, so something that can be very um, personal from space, sense of familiarity, the sea, visuals that affirm life and it's all its nuances, black people, black love, human connection, visual engagement, memes, yes, that's a way to cope too. Um, strangers helping strangers, babies, hands on flesh. Ooh, the texture on that, on that visual. I love this photo of this young woman who I don't know. <laughs> um, 
I just love her smile, the, 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 the scrunched up eyes, you know, that authentic smile that's just completely unabashed, um, you know, the tongue out, just like mid giggle, you know, um, the beautiful brown sheen of her skin, her shoulders, the beads, the lipstick, the visor, it reminds me of my youth. Um, and it just looks so joyful and, and present and real. And I, I love this image. Thank you so much for sharing um, such a beautiful image and the joy, right? The absolute, like being so in the moment and joyful and yeah. the release of that in the face. And I love the, the tongue out, everything. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing. It's so beautiful. <laughs> that healing place is this, to me, it just felt like the reinventing of whatever it is, like a place of reinvention and the altar as a place of temple within in the self and the, within myself and that um, I don't know, coming from like a ground zero place and maturing it to a new um, stand of wherever it is that I'm um, looking at an altar as as um, a place of new delivery that I could take and surrender, a, a place of surrender, a place where um, I could place my my burden down um, outside my my outer in the outer environment and come away with something new in my inner environment. Zeus, thank you so much for such a beautiful um, way of thinking around an altar as uh, transmuting energy. Um, in the way that I'm understanding uh, your, your thought process is how this act of doing something externally is then at the same time transmuting that energy internally and transforming it um, and reverberating. Uh, and I love that, that concept of thinking about the energy that exists within us, but also external from us. Um, and it goes back to this concept of light. Um, one that I thought myself as a light worker in my intro, and then um, during Jasmine's intro, be having that really beautiful quote around how light can be deeply in union with evocation. Um, and that if we are thinking about as, as us as light holders, light keepers, um, this practice of, of an altar, whether it is physical or it's in the self, it's internal, um, whether it's grabbing from memories um, or even tangible things um, like un velario or something along those lines, if you're a human who has an altar in your home and, and your practice is, is using candles, for example, um, how all of these things are in deep union with the past, the present, and also the future. Um, so I want us to, to think about this and to hold this concept uh, because it's going to actually take us into our next uh, mode of making. Um, and I did want to think about how visuals might also keep, what visuals might we keep alive through an altar, right? So if we are thinking about um, our memories um, and specifically in this workshop, we're thinking about visuals, right? We're making this film. Um, what visuals might we keep alive through an altar? Um, and hold on to that, hold on to this question. Um, because when we come to our break, you will be, you will have the time to kind of mine through your own archives and also other archives that exist on the, uh, on the virtual space um, to think about this, like, what visuals are being kept alive through building something, through creating this beautiful foundation? Um, and this will be our exercise that we'll be coming back to. But what we're going to be working on to, together is to create a healing altar through visual narratives. We will take seven minutes to assemble the media that's on your phone, desktop, or working surface. So if you're a person who has physical materials, you still will be able to participate in this um, using some of those documents or maybe actual photographs that you might have around. Around, um, and that you should feel free to use some of the techniques from our first arc, uh, exercise uh, where Jasmine was talking a little bit about screen recording, screen grabbing, using things from your phone. And I will also walk us through some of those things um, and to consider some of these following questions. Who or what are you keeping alive through your film? How will our descendants engage with this work? 
right? So the idea is that this work is going to exist beyond us. So if we're leaving it beyond us, uh, who's going to engage with it? How are they going to engage with it? Um, what is that feeling? What is that inner um, soul work that you want them to be working through while engaging with this work? All right. Uh, so first and foremost, if, if I'm thinking around this concept of like healing um, imagery and, and creating an altar, specifically building this altar, who am I making it for? Am I making it for myself? Who am I honoring? Um, I want to understand what's the core of my own questioning. Why am I even doing this kind of why am I embarking on this journey, right? Because it's not an easy one, as Jasmine was saying. Uh, so what is at the core of my own questioning? And I think a lot of that has to do with, for me, with the passing of my mother. Um, and then when she passed away, I was coming into um, adulthood and not having a reference point, right? Not having someone that I can actually talk to about all of these things. Um, and then realizing that the only thing that I had of hers were these pictures and her diaries and her diaries were actually incredibly sad. And then I realized that my mother like actually suffered from depression and all of these other things that were going on in her life that I had no clue about. Uh, so these answers that I was seeking, I was really not getting the ones that I wanted or the ones that I thought that I wanted. Um, and so thinking about that, um, but that led me to sort of look at all of the other things that I did have around me that she once touched. And this is kind of just a quick mashup of what I was thinking about when, when I'm thinking about the core of a questioning. So this is my mother's handwriting in the center. Uh, I was at my father's house. We do have a, a, a practice in my family of keeping altars in the home. And his altar has this very old Bible that's like falling apart. But I recall that my mother used to actually light the candle in front of this altar every day. Um, so I was looking through it for any sign of her, like a handwriting, a highlight, anything. Um, and on the last page, this was this was present. Um, and she wrote this, I don't, I'm not sure where she uh, got it from, where she, what she was looking at. Um, but it says to know the true value of time, we must seize and enjoy every moment of it. Uh, and I loved that. I'm like, oh, what's this idea of enjoyment? How do we enjoy? How do we understand time? If time is this idea of a construct, how am I walking through it with so much joy and so much rhythm um, that it's honoring all of the hardships of my ancestors because I am I am an amalgamation of them. Um, so the picture behind it or the two pictures that are kind of next to it, one is a photograph that I took. Uh, I split my time between here and the Caribbean and loving the color and the texture of the island and always wishing that I'm there when I'm not there. Um, and then the screenshot to the right is an image that my father took of me. My father and I have a, a very difficult relationship, um, but one that I'm trying myself to heal through actually all of my work. Um, and he took that video of me swimming in um, un cenote, uh, and, and I was surrounded by um, petroglyphs and just at my absolute happiest. Um, and water does that for me. Um, so thinking about that moment with my father and swimming and water and that that's a connection for the both of us. I am. So what I do begin with a concept image clip. Sometimes I write. And in this case, it's my mother's writing that kind of sparked this um, or visuals that move you. Um, I was looking through uh, my family's WhatsApp um, and that's incredibly lively and everybody's sharing random stuff from all over the world. And my brother actually shared with us this old VHS clip that he had access to. Again, utilizing that wonderful screen recording. And this is just my cousin and my brother getting down at a family party. 
And I love the movement and the motion of it and how much uh, joy there is in dancing, um, especially for my family. We are all really musical. Um, and even myself, when I'm feeling down, I just need to move my body. Um, so that kind of sparked everything. I was like, okay, this is incredible. I have my mom's handwriting that's talking about joy and time. And then I have this beautiful clip of my family getting down in 1988. I'm not even in this clip. It's my brother and my cousin, but I love how they're both like in it, in it to win it. Um, and then that led me to this idea of like, how do I understand the emotions present when engaging with narrative. Um, so it brings up a lot for me, this idea that I'm not around my family anymore. My family lives all over the world um, and I don't have access to them in the way that I once did. And it brings up a lot. It brings up happiness, but also sadness um, and longing and, and nostalgia. Um, so really working through some of those ideas um, and then gathering materials that align with it and creating mood boards. I'm a major mood boarder. I love it. So I'm constantly pairing things that are analog, writing uh, different kinds of documentation with my own photographs and trying to figure out, well, what is this theme? What is it that I'm saying um, through just storyboarding? And this can be done on your desktop as well. And then that takes us to this idea of like, how do we begin to heal through time and space? Because we are working with film that is thinking about time um, and in this physical space, but also in this virtual space, like how are we working through some of those initial emotions through this film? Um, and so exploring the narratives present through, uh, through preparing a, mo a mood boarding, I did this kind of really fun desktop mood board that combines some of what we've all been talking about. Like, how do we work with still images? How do we work with like old home movies, VHS tapes, all of all of that jazz? How do we work with actual physical documentation and um, uh, film clips on our phone? Um, so I created this actually this is about a minute so this could actually stand in for for this film if I wanted to but this is really just a way for me to work through some ideas and I used uh, the quick time player just record my screen function no it does not record the audio that's playing but that's another step is thinking about like well what is the sonic um, atmosphere or vibe that I'm going for in thinking about this so starting with some slides, which I recorded on my phone playing on a projector, moving on to a clip of me dancing that a friend of mine took, moving on to that initial clip that I grabbed from my WhatsApp, moving on to all of these photographs that I found throughout generations of my family dancing, and ending with this like, just stream of consciousness writing. Um, it's in Spanish because sometimes I feel like I express myself better in Spanish than I do in English. Uh, and what it says is, um, my family always dance in the kitchen and, the, and nosotros and us um, around them, the gift of our ancestors rhythm, which will be the last word. And then opening back up to that original uh, slide uh, recording that I took. So that's a way that you can actually engage with a little bit of all of the tools that uh, Jasmine and I have been talking about. Like, how are you using your desktop? How are you using um, your social media? How are you using um, actual documentation that you might have around you? And in the most simplest form, none of that is edited. It's all just recorded. And I literally sat there just timing it, thinking about my flow. What am I going for? Um, and this to me is a way of, of really kind of working through some of my own ideas so that I can then move into an editing process. Um, but I'm wondering if humans would feel comfortable uh, sharing some of the work that they've created with our time together today. All right, I'm going to share screen. Yeah. 
superintendent of Springfield Public School. I have. Yay! All of these Uh, okay, so like I said, um, <laughs> I just put them together. I didn't finish um, actually editing. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I would definitely cut it down significantly and find ways to make it more fluid, but those are the pieces that I want to work with, so. Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing and volunteering um, your entire thought process. Um, so intimate and those moments of like the spanning of the bed um, and that pure happiness. And I want to, I want to, I want to live in there. I want to live in that space that you created. Um, and then the Pina, like, <sighs> As a person that loves dance and motion, I'm like, yes, take me, take me, take me to all of those spaces. Um, and I can't wait to see the next iteration of that, right? Because what you have just presented me is, or presented for us is just this like, just solace. I don't know. Cool, yay, that's what I was hoping for. And yeah, I can't wait to, I mean, I didn't think about even looking at any of this footage at all. I'm glad that we did this today and, and you're really about like looking into our own, yeah, into our own stuff, into our own memories. Um, this is really helpful for me and I can't wait to actually make this a project. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna be brief and just gas, gas you and say, I love, I love the pacing. I think that especially those like, interruption shots it's really doing something when you go from like the calmness into this like blip it's like whoa whoa, whoa what i love so i really like that and i just love the integration of like yourself and your physical body in the film um and it, like feeling rooted in this way and then also like ending the salutation like there's something a little trolly about it too I i'm really appreciating the tone of this piece Benita, thank you so much for sharing and for being so open and, and honest and for everyone else who shared. Um, and just, um, I want to honor Ruth, who's, who's been waiting patiently, if you feel um, ready and comfortable to share. Thank you. Yes. And um, I want to echo everyone's responses about uh, Bonita's piece. It was beautiful um, and, it, and it felt healing. Um, so I guess I'll share my screen. I'm going to share my um, Adobe Premiere workspace. So um, uh, just want to tell you a little brief uh, preamble. Um, I'm also dealing with uh, right now uh, with uh, blackness in natural spaces. So. And this is an archive from my family's Super 8 films from 1960s. That's it. <laughs> Gorgeous. 
the archivist. Oh my gosh, the archival recording is golden. Also, <laughs> shouts out to whoever went through and actually got that digitized because that's half the battle with things like that. And I also just want to shout out to you. I'm not sure if you were able, I know you had a question around color correcting and like blending. I could not tell, like you said, there's some newer clips, like it didn't feel super disjointed. So oh, okay. it, the images, like I think obviously you could do that final pass at the back end if you want for your own liking. But I do think that these images, there's a really nice harmony um, and pacing. And I'd be curious to see um, what a scoring element might do or what that that component might do with what component like scoring or the kind of so, I think yes. just like the, the element of audio yes I think would be kind of that final harmony but the, the motion and the pacing things are feeling really good thank you thank you so much <laughs> And I actually believe that we can take one more. Uh, so I, and I want to, I believe it was Sierra, right? Am I right? I have to like scroll back up to make sure that that was the human that said that they wanted to share. Yes. Yeah, Sierra. yeah. Sierra, you said that you felt comfortable sharing your work in progress. We'd love to see it. Um, and please, the floor is yours. So I just took some images from my uh, my Snapchat, my Snapchat, or oh, not images. I grew up a little girl with dreams, 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 dreams. So that's all I have so far. <laughs> I've been working on that while we were talking earlier. So. Yo, thank you for yes. sharing. Wow. So um, I don't know how to stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the bottom or at, maybe at the top, there's like a pause looking button. Uh, um, oh, time. I see it. Sorry. Okay. I think I did it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Incredible. I would highly encourage you. Um, <clears throat> to continue working on it and submit it. It's gorgeous. And like this imagery is so strong. I want to ask you like where this is, how, who this child is, what is the context? For them? But I also don't want to know, like I love, it's like, it's very, it feels like healing imagery. And I like the way that you've superimposed the clouds over it. I think, um, you know, what is that? Is that some logic? Cause it's coming through, but I'm also like, I think that'll be the challenge, but it's also like, I don't think it'll be a challenge for you to make some scoring that feels really nice and transcendent with this. So, Thank yeah. You. Thank you. And then, yeah, yeah. Check out those SoundCloud rappers. See, maybe people did like mm -hmm. remixes or covers or whatever too, if you're really trying to go for that. It, like if you're really attached to that Solange vibe, see if there's someone else who did a take on that or is inspired by that. Yes. Thank you. That was actually just something I had on my computer already. So it was easy to, to, throw in there for that for the timing but yeah I would definitely I, I, I never thought about using SoundCloud for that but yeah thank you for that yeah, make yeah it I, I feel like um it, you know going back to like this idea of light that we've been talking about um that what you shared is pure light right it's like this beautiful um existence that we carry within us and that like I just never I never want to lose that light that you're presenting us with that is just us observing ourselves right like in this pure play in a very similar way that Bonita's talking about like the sensuality of touch like what is that sensuality of experience of like the sky of joy I love it thank you so much for sharing for being so open um it makes me super um grateful to be in the space and to witness, just to witness life. Thank you for uplifting my week. Thank you. Thank you.